Good morning. I'm really honored and uh, humbled to stand here in the legacy of Sai, who I knew from uh, from Calgary from my several visit there, and uh, he invited me over to uh, advisory groups to uh, put, provide some input into his uh, many projects. He was quite a unique person, and uh, he was a good friend. He was also, to me, an important role model in his work in, in Alberta and in Canada. Now, my title today for the presentation is Changing the Narrative, Progress and Challenges to Improve Osteoarthritis Care for More Than 4 Million Canadians. As a warm-up, let me give you a few facts, and then I'll go into maybe some areas of controversy. And again, I'll remind you, as pointed out, uh, that I'm actually an orthopedic surgeon myself, a clinician scientist. So my, my clinical hat is in orthopedic surgery. And that's perhaps, uh, perhaps I sh should be a reminder when I present some of the challenges we're facing. So anyway, more than 4 million Canadians are afflicted by osteoarthritis. Women more likely than men. And osteoarthritis is by far the most common joint disease. It causes more functional limitation and disability than any other chronic disease among the elderly. It provides more than 90% of the indications for total joint replacements. And in Canada, you do roughly 130,000 of those each year, meaning that today, 500 will be done. On Thursday this week, another 500, so 2,500 per week, 10,000 per month, 130,000 roughly per year. These are big numbers. It also means these are big dollars, and it keeps increasing. Both uh, osteoarthritis and total joint replacements keep increasing each year. In Canada, every second Canadian with osteoarthritis reports moderate to severe pain. This means that this population, this subset of Canadians, consume large amounts of painkillers. And that's another issue I'll be touching on, and the problems that that lead to currently. Osteoarthritis, in contrast to what we might have believed in the past, actually is associated with excess mortality. We die from osteoarthritis, actually. The risk ratio is between 1.2 and 1.5. And this takes place in the face of the fact that health budgets actually increase faster than the GDP in most countries in the world. And an increasing focus as a result of that on health for the dollar. And where we are pushed to eliminate low value practices, invest in high value practices. Now, let me just say a few words about osteoarthritis using one simple slide here. This may be our eponymous image of osteoarthritis that comes before us when we think the word, the term, the diagnosis, osteoarthritis. The old lady, the old man maybe, with pain, impairment, loss of participation, etc. That's true. Osteoarthritis is far more common among the elderly than the middle-aged or the young, for sure. But this is also osteoarthritis. This patient will have osteoarthritis of the knees for sure in her lifetime if she doesn't already have it. She has one of the major risk factors for osteoarthritis being obesity and overweight. This is another way of uh, getting osteoarthritis, of adding up those, uh, those little uh, triangles in the jar, as we heard from the previous speaker, the environmental factors adding to your genetic, genetic risk, which is roughly 50% in, in the population of the total risk of osteoarthritis that you may have in a lifetime. There are other ways to get injuries, and certainly when we think of our kids, we should be thinking about the prevention programs, which are effective, but which are not uh, sufficiently uh, used in real, in real life in uh, youth sports. And there are other sports certainly practiced in some areas here in Canada where you can get these sorts of injuries. And you can get it in your working life for sure as well. If you're a farmer, lifelong hard work, physical work, 
exposed to injuries, or fishermen, for example, or firemen, for that matter, with hard, work, hard physical work and also increased risks of injuries. So how do we today best manage this very common disease? Well, by getting it right first time in the ideal situation. However, that is not always true, and I'll provide you with a few examples. Now, the three pillars we look at, we summarize osteoarthritis management in the clinical world, are exercise, drugs against the pain, and surgery. These are the three pillars that we uh, today can use in managing this very common condition. And among those pillars, we have actually the good, the bad, and some ugly. And I'll give you a few examples. Firstly, though, to summarize our current management, the basis, the platform of any other management of osteoarthritis is education, telling the patient, informing the patient what this disease is about what is likely to develop in the future and not likely to develop into in, in, in the future. Exercise programs, weight loss, and above all, helping the patient to develop a self-management, a coping, uh, man, uh, coping uh, activity with regards to their disease. This is helpful for all stages of osteoarthritis, all ages, essentially all patients, and it helps these patients really well. It doesn't help them fully out. Some will need additional help, such as walking aids, drugs for, against the pain, and some will eventually need surgery, for sure. And like 130,000 or even more in Canada each year, telling us again that the the number of people living with osteoarthritis is far greater than those that need surgery, actually. So only a minority will be needing surgery. So as I mentioned, exercise is an effective drug against osteoarthritis. It is more effective than the painkillers we can prescribe to our patients against osteoarthritis pain, a chronic pain state. But the full potential requires a series of focused, supervised, progressed sessions over a period of at least six weeks before the patient can actually start usually experiencing a relief in the pain. And it is, of course, not easy to convince patients with osteoarthritis, say, knee osteoarthritis, who have heard probably from other sources that, yes, my, my knees are worn out, this is a wear and tear disease. And then I'm trying to, to convince these patients actually to increase their physical activity. And when they perceive, when they begin this, that it even hurts more. So they need to get over this threshold. And they need to be able to actually be supported to do this over a certain period before they start feeling the benefit or experiencing the benefits. And this is not easy against what we perceive as reality in this area. Lifestyle change, as we all know, is not easy. In Scandinavia, where I'm active, in Sweden, in Denmark, we have developed a couple of different programs, and I'll just uh, give you this particular one, which is actually now being introduced in Canada as well. It's called GLAD, after the Danish version, Good Life with Osteoarthritis in Denmark. It's an evidence-based tool for clinicians. It consists of a two-day course for physios and other health professionals, and who then lead eight weeks of education and supervised neuromuscular exercise for patients with knee or hip osteoarthritis. And we register the outcomes for each patient at baseline at the end of the course and at one year. So we know how this works for these patients. And we keep tra track of them. In Sweden, we've treated like more than 100,000 patients with this program. In Denmark, now more than 30,000, and it's still being ramped up in both countries. In Canada, you can find it at the web address uh, shown at the bottom of the slide there. The results of this program, we know, are less pain, better function, increased physical activity, fewer on sick leave, and fewer taking pain medication. 
This works. It really works. This is good stuff. There are also web-based and mobile phone-based versions of programs of this kind being uh, launched in Sweden, in the UK, and even in the United States. Uh, because we are aware that not every patient has access to a physio, and not every patient actually likes going to the physio and training in a group. Some want to do it in their home, uh, on their own volition. Of course, some patients will need drugs against osteoarthritis pain. We used to put forward uh, paracetamol, acetaminophen, acetaminophen as the first choice. We do not do that anymore because we are aware that, number one, it is actually not that effective against osteoarthritis pain. And there are issues with overdosing of these drugs, which uh, create nasty effects on the liver, unfortunately. So the utility for osteoarthritis pain is really quite questionable. We do recommend using non-steroidal anti-inflammatory drugs, the usual ibuprofen, naproxen, and, and uh, other drugs within that family. We primarily rec recommend them as topical creams because of the potential side effects, because these patients often have comorbidities in the form of uh, hypertension, obesity, and a variety of, of other issues uh, as well. These are very commonly prescribed, two-thirds of the population usually uh, take that during any given year. So are there stronger pain medications? Yes, maybe, but are they actually stronger in their effect against osteoarthritis? This is a, uh, a uh, panel or three different panels of so-called forest plots. This one shows effects of clinical trials of NSAIDs against osteoarthritis pain. This one, weak opioids against, against osteoarthritis pain and strong opioids. And those of you who are somewhat used to reading these diagrams will note that the average symbol within each panel actually end up right above each other, showing from the systematic review published last year that Opioids are not more effective against osteoarthritis pain than NSAIDs, be they weak opioids, quote-unquote, or strong op opioids. This is a really important message, a really important message. So there is really no reason to prescribe opioids for osteoarthritis pain or for any other chronic pain uh, condition for that matter. And nevertheless, we have data from Sweden that I'm familiar with that shows that in any given year, 25% of the osteoarthritis population are prescribed an opioid. This is bad medicine. We should not do this. We are contributing to the opioid epidemic, the one that you are aware of as well as I think most of us are aware of in, in different countries around the world. And this is a slide from your, uh, your um, Deputy Health Minister showing some data from Canada earlier this year. More than 10,000 Canadians dying from op overdose of opioids uh, during two and two and a half year period compared to 13,000 dying from HIV and AIDS over a 12 year period. And, of course, the majority of this is caused by illicit, illegal opioids, fentanyl uh, analogs and, and, their, and, and that family, yes. But many of these patients were actually started in opioids because we, as doctors, prescribe them to them. I have contributed, well, I'm not personal, but my profession, orthopedic surgeons and rheumatologists contribute to the opioid epidemic in Sweden by prescribing opioids to patients with osteoarthritis. And also, quite remarkably, we prescribe, you prescribe, I should say, perhaps in this country, uh, opioids in situations where I believe that this is not really medically defensible. Because uh, I'm just looking now at the diagnosis there within the red circle called knee meniscectomy. That is keyhole surgery of the knee for 
in, usually in patients with early stage osteoarthritis. That's a great majority that are provided with this intervention. Now, the incision is about this, less than a centimeter long, two or three of them. This is minor surgery. This is trivial surgery on a scale of it. And yet 80% of Canadian arthroscopists, orthopedic surgeons, have prescribed an opioid in the post-operative phase for these patients. What in the world? What are they thinking? Even Sweden, where that little gray bar originates from, we prescribe to these patients in, uh, at the rate of about 10%, which I still think is too high. But 80%? I'm shaking my head and, and saying, this is bad medicine, simply, because not only are these patients exposed to risk of getting uh, into problems with their opioids, but also the family of those individuals who have been pre prescribed opioids are at increased risk of actually overdosing on opioids because they are available in the home. The risk is between 3 and 15-fold, a very beautiful dose response curve actually. This is bad medicine. We need to stop this. What are the causes of this? Well, there are many causes and of course marketing is one important cause. This particular ad is from 1901 and uh, other uh, forms of marketing uh, we can smile at in the same way. This was probably from, I'd say, the 50s or something like that. The opioid marketing of today is, I'm sure, more sophisticated, but it's no less powerful. And we can sort of point the finger at the industry, but we as medical professionals ha share some of the guilt in what, has, what is going on with the op current opioid epidemic. So let's consider that and do our best to stop that practice. So let me move over to some of having gone from exercise to drugs and now into surgical uh, modalities for managing osteoarthritis. And here is another one of my pet topics and pet arguments. Arthroscopic surgery for the painful knee of the middle-aged and older patient. This is very commonly, uh, commonly done. It's uh, in the US, the numbers are more than half a million a year. So I'd suggest without knowing that in Canada, you do at least 50,000 per year of these. It's very common. And it is today quite controversial. Here is another forest plot. It's a cumulative forest plot with a series of clinical trials, all of them comparing arthroscopic meniscal surgery with a control intervention uh, being non-surgical, such as an exercise program, care as usual, or even placebo surgery. And uh, each uh, trial adds to the, to the average. Uh, uh, so the one down here is actually the sum of all of those trials being up there. It's a dozen trials or so by now. This is one of the most well-examined orthopedic procedures with clinical trials. And every, every, all that's happened during these uh, almost 20 years is actually that the confidence interval has gotten to be narrower here. We're more and more certain that this is actually the effect of this intervention, suggesting that, yes, there is a benefit of this particular surgical intervention, but it's approximately three millimeters on a 100 millimeter scale, so that actually it is far from clinically relevant it is what we would say clinically irrelevant benefit by this form of surgery as compared, for example, to the exercise program that I gave an example of before, sending the patient to the GLAD pro program instead of sending the patient to the arthroscopic surgeon is actually good medicine. This is not good medicine anim anymore. In spite of these dozen trials, there are, of course, many that claim that it is actually uh, effective in my particular patient subset and in a variety of other arguments that we get. 
in spite of the evidence actually really quite forcefully now can, that can be made saying that lifestyle modifications and exercise are as effective as, as arthroscopic surgery in managing the painful knee of the middle-aged and older patient. So claiming this, standing as an orthopedic surgeon in front of my colleagues is swimming upstream. And there is there are lots of arguments from uh, die-hard arthroscopists who claim a variety of counter-arguments saying, for example, that uh, patients with uh, mechanical symptoms, the knee is sort of locking, catching, uh, can't really straighten or can't really bend it sufficiently, uh, they have a better outcome of this surgery. That's actually within some of the current guidance. But that guidance is not up to date with regards to the evidence because uh, my counter argument is no, they don't. And there are like 10 different studies saying where we have actually looked for subsets within the big population that might be more, have a more beneficial effect of this particular surgical intervention. But the, we've failed to find any. There aren't any subsets within the population that have a better outcome. Those men with mechanical symptoms actually have a worse outcome. So again, as someone swimming upstream, you wonder what is it that makes it so difficult for us as orthopedic surgeons? Well, it's not unique for the orthopedic surgeon field. This is true in all specialty fields where someone comes up and says, what you've been doing for the last few years is really not effective. You need to stop doing that. That meets a lot of resistance. And of course, what I think it means is that we as orthopedic surgeons or cardiologists or whatever we might have as a specialty are humans because we are prone to the same biases and the same issues, psychological issues as anyone else. We live in our filter bubbles. We are prone to confirmation bias. We are prone to cog cognitive dissonance and we are biased. We are influenced by vested interests. That's reality, and we need to be aware of this and work with these issues within our professions and recognize that actually it's not knowledge that we actually lack. What is missing is too often our courage to understand what we know and draw the conclusions of the evidence that actually is there. Let me move to something on a more positive note. Uh, within orthopedic surgery and within caring for the osteoarthritis patients. Total joint replacements. We do, you do a lot of these in this country each year, and that is because it is generally good surgery for the right patient at the right time. It is really a remarkably cost-effective and positive form of surgery for the individual patient. But, there's always a but, there are in those patients, among those patients that have this form of surgery, something like 2 out of 10, 20%, varying in different studies between, say, 10 and 30, but let's uh, settle for the number 20%, that are not satisfied with the outcome of their surgery. And sometimes it is because there was a problem with the implant, there was a problem with the surgical procedure, there might have been an infection, these things do happen. But generally speaking, we are often at a loss in explaining what is the problem because we can examine the patients, we can do imaging, we can do all kinds of things, and everything looks perfect, sort of objectively, quote unquote, but the patient is not satisfied. And I think this is because we have not perhaps sufficiently explored the expectations of the individual patient. We have not done our homework, so to say, when we put up some of our patients on the waiting list for this form of surgery. And we might be mistaken in looking at too much at the imaging, at the x-ray films or the MRIs or the CAT scans or whatever it might be, and looking at a destroyed joint and thinking, well, there is a destroyed joint and this patient is not happy with the situation, so let's fix the joint and then everything will be fine. That is sometimes not the case and we need to become a bit smarter because out of the 500 joint replacements being done today in Canada, maybe 100 patients are not actually happy with the outcome and that 
might, you might consider an 80% success rate an excellent form of surgery or an excellent form of management. If you were a rheumatologist and your first biological drug was actually 80% effective, you'd be saying, wow, fantastic. But if you're a rheumatologist and your drug doesn't work, you can switch to another one or you can take the patient off the drug. We can't undo the surgery. We can't back out having done the surgery. We can't put back the original hip or knee again to the patient. If we do it, it's done and it's not reversible. So I think we are, uh, we are obliged to put a bit more research into this particular area and trying to refine, trying to improve our patient selection for joint surgery. And finally, and I think perhaps implicit in what I've been trying to explain to you briefly here, we need to change the narrative. We need to change the message to the patient and to the community at large, GPs all through, that joint pain is a modifiable symptom related to sensitized joint structures, influenced by many factors, many factors, including genetics, by the way, rather than solely related to joint damage damaged joint structures. So we need to shift the focus away from the structural damage model. I've seen many patients with joints looking terrible on imaging, but the, the symptoms the patient has are really quite trivial and quite reverse, and, and the reverse uh, situation where patients have really excruciating, excruciating symptoms, but very little objective imaging changes on the, uh, on the films or on the images. And we do need, finally, of course, to put the patient in charge. As clinicians, we must and we should engage in person-centered care while coaching our patients towards self-management. With these measures, with, these ch with this changing of the narrative, where we put the patient in charge and where we support the patient to self-manage this condition, we can, we know from what we've done so far, that we can increase the proportion of individuals who actually can live well with their osteoarthritis and manage it themselves and are far more happier than they are today with their own situation. So to sum everything up, I'd say it's not about decreasing osteoarthritis as a disease. It's about decreasing the burden of osteoarthritis. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Lomander. There's time for some questions. Ronaldo Batista, Encopole, Montreal. Uh, you mentioned the importance of exercise in the treatment of osteoarthritis, but what about the relationship between exercise and the development of osteoarthritis? And more specifically, I'm referring to jogging, of course. Exercise is important. There, we don't need any more clinical trials to ascertain that, to demonstrate that. We know that there's been more than 50, between 50 and 100 clinical trials, all showing this is good for the osteoarthritic joint, for the patient with osteoarthritis. The mechanisms, though, we need to work on. And coming back then to your question about is, can, it, can you have too much exercise? Generally speaking, uh, I would say that unless you acquire, unless you get a joint injury in the course of exercising, uh, such, such as playing ball games or skiing or what have you, generally speaking, it's very, very difficult to wear out your joint by marathon running or marathon skiing or whatever you might be considering. There are some interesting data on the super elite individuals, suggesting that they may have an increased rate of osteoarthritis later in life, even though they haven't had any injuries. But that's really far out on the uh, sort of uh, toe of any normal distribution. So generally speaking, it's not an issue. 
Uh, Susan Denberg, McMaster. Uh, my question was about mechanism of improvement with exercise on uh, on knee uh, pain. And you mentioned you need to do research in it. Could you speculate sorry, what I'm might be going on? It's difficult to hear what you're saying. Try again. Oh, I'm sorry. Um, I was asking about the mechanism of improvement with exercise on, on knee pain and whether you could speculate. The other question I have is, is there a relationship of benefit to age? Uh, does it diminish if exercise in people with OA, would it diminish as people get older? Uh, the thing about exercise, let me begin with the, with the last part of your question. The thing about exercise is that it's good whatever is your age. And whatever you do from your baseline in increasing exercise is good. It's good for your knee, and I didn't include those slides here, but it's obviously also good for your cardiovascular system, for your brain, for your uh, diabetes, if you have one, it's, or against diabetes, and a number of other medical conditions. So. This also brings in the issue that if you're a cardiologist and you're telling your patient you should get more active, this is good for your heart, etc., whatever, it'll decrease your risk for future cardiovascular disease. You better check with the patient, what about your knees? And vice versa, I, as an orthopedic surgeon, with a patient with knee osteoarthritis, need to consider, does this patient have diabetes? cardiovascular risk factors, and all kinds of other things, because these all interleave. And if you, if you can improve, if you can improve the ability of the patient actually to increase physical activity through a program such as the GLAD or a similar program, then you're doing not good not only for the knees or the hips, but also for other conditions very of common complex diseases that we all know about. This is about these lifestyle changes. Now, the mechanisms of this. I, this is my personal interpretation. I'm not an expert in, expert in, in exercise physiology. I'm not a physio. I'm just a simple-minded orthopedic surgeon. So I believe that there is more, obviously more than one mechanism. Part of it, I think, is local because you, you can buy strengthening the muscle, you can by improving your neuromuscular uh, coordination, you can actually make your joints work better, so to say. That's fairly simple to understand, I think, and it, and it makes good sense, and I think it's true also. But I'm also convinced there are other mechanisms involved that involve, you know, uh, simply put, endorphins and the rewiring of our brains, etc., when we start using our bodies in an appropriate way again and increase our, our activities. There are a number of different uh, such mechanisms that I'm sure kick in, and that's what I hinted at by saying we do need to understand the mechanisms of benefits and possible harms with exercise better. Thank you very much. Sid Kennedy from uh, University of Toronto, thank you for an excellent talk on essentially doing the best we can with today's procedures. But my question is, what do you think, how far are we from uh, stem cell generation of new hips or new knees? There's a lot of research going on, both in uh, pharma, trying to find drugs that actually, actually would slow down the development, uh, the progress of osteoarthritis. It's so far not been successful. It's been tried many times, and billions of dollars, I'm sure, put into the effort. There is ongoing work with stem cells, but any stem cell treatment or injections of a variety of kinds that I, I, I hesitate to even define uh, is experimental and not supported by evidence today. So don't waste your money on it. Don Stacy from the University of Ottawa. I've done some work in osteoarthritis and involving patients in the decisions, um, but one of the challenges in Canada is our publicly funded healthcare system doesn't fund all of the options. So it's cheap, it's free to go get surgery, but it's not free to do physiotherapy or um, 
which I think we can all agree is um, not quite, uh, does not make sense. But so, I also think <laughs> this is an opportunity for something like the Academy to actually push, especially when the evidence is so clear around something like the GLAD program, that this should be funded for people with osteoarthritis. Let it's me give you an example, actually, a real life uh, story, because in Denmark, where the GLAD program was developed based on an earlier Swedish version, the situation was exactly what you're describing five years ago. And then the GLAD actually, well, the GLAD was started developing before then, but uh, within about five, since the, in the last past five years, it's really taken off in Denmark, and there was uh, sort of bottom, a bottom-up opinion from local politicians who actually noticed that this program was taking off and patients were talking about it. Patients were actually talking to their local politicians who then talked to the national politicians and finally the parliament actually decided that all right we have to change this. Now let's fund actually physiotherapy as we are funding the osteoscopic surgery for these individuals. And in some countries and some systems, I'm also aware that the arthroscopic surgery for this particular condition and this particular patient category is actually taken off the insurance. And I think that shows that it is possible to make a change. <laughs>